so the the pathology comes when you can't get out of those negative pathways and and find your way out of that to a more positive space and so what the tms is actually doing is is physically creating new um synaptical connections and creating new neuronal pathways in the brain to allow for these positive networks to form Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Sessions. Today, I couldn't be more excited to have uh, just an amazing guest on our um, our podcast. Her name is Dr. Georgine Nanos. Welcome, Dr. Nanos, to the podcast. Thank you so much, Rob. I'm so excited to be here. Well, great. And I, I particularly, lots of times we have lots of PhD, mental health practitioners, that type of thing. And so to have this really amazing cross-section of you being a, uh, an MD and then your experience, I can't just wait to begin to talk to you and see how your views on mental health and how you weave that in and, and what you're seeing these days. But um, just to do an introduction for our listeners, uh, Dr. Nanos is the medical director and CEO of Kind, the Kind Health Group in um, San Diego and specifically in, in Encinitas. But Maybe if you could, Dr. Nanos, get us, give us a little bit of orientation around your practice uh, and what you offer would be great. Yeah, sure. So our practice is uh, primarily a concierge, what started as a concierge primary care practice. And um, now over the last year or so, we are also offering accelerated TMS to, um, to a number of patients in our community and from around the country. Uh, we also have a med spa associated with the practice, but my primary focus is on um, on primary care and um, and TMS treatment. Wow, it's just amazing. If if I can ask, what really uh, gave you this? Maybe the vision is <laughs> is is a good word to be more inclusive and see this uh, treatment in a different way. Well, I would say, so I, I've been practicing uh, family medicine for now over 20 years here in, in San Diego. And Sanitas is a northern suburb of San Diego County. And for the first 15 years of my career, I was practicing in a traditional primary care setting. I was a partner in a, a medium-sized group. I was seeing 25 to 30 patients a day, um, which is a lot. I had 4,000 patients assigned to my panel. I was very busy. Um, I was charting, you know, well past midnight at 1 a.m. many nights of the week. Um, but I loved, I and I still love practicing medicine and, and wanted to figure out a way that I could continue to do it for as long as I could in my lifetime. And kind of seeing the writing on the wall there that this was not a sustainable model for me or my life um, to deliver care the way I wanted to, to deliver it to patients. I just didn't feel like I was taking good enough care of people. And so I left that practice, which was a wonderful training ground for, for family medicine and, and just had, you know, the best colleagues and and greatest patients, but wanted to find a way that I could, um, better serve people and, and myself, um, in, in the way I provide care. And so, I started this concierge practice where we focus a lot more on on prevention and emotional and mental health in addition to physical health. So we're looking at the whole patient um, and not just their 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 physical health. So it kind of originated from that. We use a lot of we use health coaches and uh, partner with a lot of therapists in the area um, to do, deliver emotional and and physical health and treat the whole person as best we can. And then. A couple of years ago, I was introduced to TMS through a uh, <laughs> through a, a colleague of mine, and got to learn a lot more about that. And over the last year, um, we have been delivering uh, accelerated TMS treatments uh, with pretty incredible results, um, probably better than a lot of clinics throughout the world, is what I'm told. So it's, I'm very proud of that. As as you should be, yeah. And I'm, I'm, of course, I'm just fascinated because we tend to, you know, here at Embark, we see a lot of the mental health, but we're always seeing more and more of this principles of integrated health. And, you know, I'm talking to people about, oh, my gosh, microbi- gut microbiome health is <laughs> nutrition and, uh, and medication and all this stuff. It really is becoming more of an integrated holistic approach. And I love that even in your own practice, you're saying, hey, TMS for if it's 
major depressive disorder, a whole host of things that uh, we're seeing real high effectiveness across the board. My approach to medicine has always been to take a more holistic approach. You know, I, I, Right, I can write Lipitor prescriptions and Prozac prescriptions all day long. That's not what I want to do. If we can get pe- people better with lifestyle modification and, um, you know, improving their 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 mental health in in a more holistic way, that's I think always the ideal. It's what everybody wants. It's just very hard to achieve. And so, being in primary care for so many years, one of the the biggest frustrations for me has been that there isn't there hasn't been a really good uh, holistic safe solution for for mental health treatment until really until now and and um, being able to provide that to people and giving them hope um, without medication in a very safe um, with a very safe modality is has been one of the most inspirational things in my life and has really changed the direction of my career so amazing yeah, well, I, I got to say, just I, it's easy for me to get sidetracked, but you've obviously 20 plus years, it's, this is a very purpose-driven, maybe I even use the cliche term of mission for you, it feels like this principle of healing and health um, seems very, yeah, purposeful to you. Very much so. It, it is um, kind of the 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 fiber of my being just to for better or for worse kind of defi- defines me um so that's not always good <laughs> i'm kind of working all the time <laughs> given that this is uh you know our, our audience tends to be uh you know interested curious people with critical thinking a lot of practitioners a lot of um therapists and psychologists i if we can just take this moment that where in your life, how did that get developed where you have this, you know, the purpose is kind of the essence of who I am? I'm curious early on in your life, what shaped that for you or mind walking us through that? So I was um, the firstborn child of, of Greek immigrants that came here to the U.S. Um, on to, to the East Coast. I'm from originally from Stamford, Connecticut, the suburb of New York City. And if you've ever seen the movie, My Big Fat Greek Wedding, that is the exact story of my life. Wow. <laughs> so, I didn't speak English until I went to kindergarten. And exactly. yeah, I had like veal sandwiches for lunch while everyone had um, peanut butter and jelly. So it was a very different upbringing. And I went to Greek school uh, instead of doing sports in, in elementary school. So that that was uh, a lot of my upbringing. Um, but I think in terms of having coming from a, a, a healing um, a, a healing perspective, I'd have to say that would come from from my dad. My dad um, unfortunately uh, had end stage kidney disease early in his life in his 40s and was on dialysis uh, for about 16 years um, from the time I was in I'd say eighth grade. And we had, and at the time, this was very unusual, and it still is. We had the hemodialysis machine in our home, um, which was operating, you know, six or six to eight hours a day, every other day. And so my dad was receiving treatments at home for um, for sixteen years, which is highly unusual for anyone to survive more than a couple of years on dialysis, let alone. 16 and my mom who's not has had no health experience whatsoever um got trained to administer the treatments for him and um and one of the reasons that he lived so long was because he had this environment of love and support and you know it became it became the norm this was part of our our lives and um the set and setting in which he received the care really changed the trajectory of his disease and extended his life by uh, an insane amount. I mean, that's, years, I, years, I don't think yeah. very often seen. So, so I think that um, certainly was the impetus to get me into healthcare, into medicine, um, and then to provide that extra level of care to people is, is what I'm, I'm most passionate about because that was kind of my, my origin story, if you will. Well, what a great story. I mean, this is just, this is why I love doing this to find out about people. What, <laughs> what, what an amazing story. And I, I'm really highlighting that you're saying it was a, 
of course, it's the treatments and having it in your home, but really the impetus or the catalyst for that longevity of that is really, you said, the love and the nurturance in the relationship. Absolutely. And and that's the foundation of what this my practice is about. It's called Kind Healthcare, Kind Health Group for a reason, because I take the kindness part very, very seriously. It, it's, it's our core value and, and my core mission is to treat every first of all ourselves with kindness and treat our patients with as much kindness and love as possible and then you know each other our community our our team um and that is that is that is the true foundation and so i think when you lead with kindness and love everything else kind of falls into place it's very idealistic but that's that's at least the idea (laughs) well i i'll be transparent part of the reason that uh yeah i wanted you on this in the podcast is just it so aligns with you know for my own my own career has been being an expert in understanding attachment and nurturance and all of this you know our core values are but so to have this complimentary to say oh it's it's about kindness and love and those really I, I had even the question down here what is your philosophy of relationship and health and you're defining it very well but it's well proven well proven that that's such an effective intervention if you will and and that's and it also has such become the the foundation of the way we administer TMS, which is very different from how it's being done, really anywhere else in the country, and and as I've been told, anywhere else in the world, and right at, at this moment in time, and hopefully that'll change, and more people will be doing it, um, in this way. So if, if you go to medical school and you you've kind of portrayed this wonderful picture of, uh, you know, going to medical school, you, you get out. And if I can rewind a little bit, did you know what you wanted to focus on while you were in medical school or h- how did that transpire? So I was one of those medical students that loved every single rotation that I did. And so when I would do my OBG, so in family, in medical school, you rotate through everything, surgery, OBGYN, psychiatry, internal medicine. And every, every time I'd go through a rotation, I'm like, okay, I'm going to be a gynecologist. Okay. I'm going to be a surgeon. I'm going to be a psychiatrist. (laughs) And then this this is it. This is the one I'm sure this is the one. Um, And so at the end, I loved them all. And really the solution is to go into family medicine, which encompasses everything. Um, So that's how I came to that. That's great. And so, and when, then you told us this wonderful story for how long were you focused in medical practice before you became aware of alternative, you know, treatments? So I, I was in the traditional practice for about 15 years. And um, and, and in, in, in the course of being a family doctor, we are also very much the front lines of, of being mental health care provider, providers as well. Um, and especially, you know, now more than ever, where there's such a scarcity of um, of access to mental health. I mean, there always has been, but it seems like now, especially post COVID, it's, it's everyone, all our mental health care providers are, are difficult to access for a lot of people. Um, it's been even more so, even more pronounced, but part the part of state of California that I live in is, um, uh, there's lots of alternative medicine approaches. So I've, I've seen that throughout my career where I have patients coming to me who are seeing me for, you know, say their their gynecologic visits or um, for whatever conditions that they have. Um, and then they're also seeing alternative healthcare providers. And, um, and so I've always been interested in those other approaches. And, and there's a lot of stuff out there that is not always, you know, the most, not always the safest approaches for patients. And so I want, but I'm very open-minded. And so I wanted to create a space for people where patients come see me and we can kind of look at all of the best practices of, of, um, of naturopathy, of, of Chinese medicine, of alternative medicine, integrative medicine, holistic medicine, functional medicine, in addition to this traditional Western medical model, because as uh, and I think this happens with a lot of MDs, you get very pigeonholed into thinking, okay, Western medicine, allopathic medicine, the people that go to medical school, um, to generalize a little bit, tend to kind of think in this one way and don't, don't always see outside of that box. And so for me, th- that's not how the world lives. The world lives way outside of that box. And so um, so I've 
want to be in that space where we can look at everything critically with a scientific approach, look at the evidence and kind of look at the best practices of all of these approaches and figure out what's best, best for each individual. And that's always different for every person. So, um, so I like to open it up myself up to all of it. And then with patients kind of go through and say, okay, this makes sense. This doesn't make sense. And this is safe, not safe. Um, and be that, that voice of reason in a very complicated uh, health and wellness space. Yeah, that, that sounds like a, a bit of a task to balance out what is the science, what is the research. I, I can't imagine even how many, and when we treat a lot of parents, you know, there's a placebo effect that's actually totally valid too, and yet people get really their hopes up for these, some of these things that may or not be proven effective, and yeah. uh, that, that's got to be a tough balance for you. Oh, yes. And then throw in a couple Google searches here and there and WebMD. off to the races. <laughs> yeah, boy, that, that's a good point. Yeah, a few videos. So you have this where you're treating people, and I, I just have to ask, just because what we do, you're starting out and you're seeing, I'm sure, like medical issues, but like you said at best, oftentimes um, practitioners are the first line to in see people are struggling with mental illness or people are struggling with these. How, how was it for your career? Were you, has it been escalating? Have you noticed an increase? I, I'm curious. Oh, absolutely. Um, every year, I feel like, it, it, I mean, for me, it almost feels like a doubling effect, but um, it's, it's, I started practicing in 2002. And I would say every year it, it is, it is getting where our mental health crisis is escalating yearly and of course after the last three years it's it's kind of it's it's really out of control um especially for our young population so um yes in primary care a lot of patients don't necessarily even understand what defines a mental health condition and so when they're coming to see their doctor for whatever routine issue they have Oftentimes in, you know, we all, 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 a lot of times screen people for these conditions, um, but even in casual conversation, what we find is a, a lot of coexisting um, mental health disorders, particularly anxiety and depression being the most prevalent um, that either people don't understand or don't, um, or, or don't understand how to quite treat or even address in, in, any, in any way. So uh, family doctors and primary care specialists or primary care doctors tend to be the front line for, for most, the access point for most mental health and um, health care in the country. Well, it's a, such a breath of fresh air, especially from a behavioral health company like ours, that we get kids and adolescents and even the parents with all these somatic symptoms. And they're like, right. you know, my stomach hurts or, <laughs> you know, I have headaches. And that, we have all this somatization of symptoms. And we're like kind of tracing that back. Well, let me know a little bit of your history. Oh, there's some severe trauma. There's been excessive anxiety all this time. And, and I'm hearing you say you're stepping away from a traditional strict medical model to say, no, no, let's view what's going on. And may, maybe that's what led to, um, I'd be curious, how did that lead into some TMS? And maybe we could define that. So the somatization is something, you know, is we see a lot. Um, and the nice thing about being in family medicine is that you can kind of rule out all the true somatic etiologies and then be able to show patients, okay, you know, we've looked at every single thing. This is probably what it is, which is usually what I may have said from the very beginning, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, understandably that's, you know, the first rule of medicine to do no harm. You want to look at every possible um, cause and, and especially the causes that, uh, you know, could potentially um, be, be harmful to people. When you get to that point, I think it's really, it's, it's depending on where they are, they are and their understanding and their acceptance of, of mental health for themselves or, you know, in general, um, people sometimes hear you say that and they think that you're saying it's, it's in their head and that's so different than what I'm that's actually okay. saying. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so I, and so it's, it's really important to explain to people, okay, I, it, it is very real. These are very real somatic issues. 
that are a physical manifestation of XYZ, depression, anxiety, PTSD. This is your body screaming what your you know, brain is trying to say. Um, so, uh, so yeah, we, I get to that point a lot with people. And so, as I was saying earlier, having, you know, uh, my, my first line has always been therapy uh, and, and me medication as needed for people. But oftentimes people are very resistant to that. There's still a really big stigma around uh, medication for mental health disorders and even therapy. And people find that, okay, I'm not gonna, I don't have time to do therapy. I can't afford to do therapy. I don't have access to therapy. I don't want to be on uh, an antidepressant. That is, you know, something that people are very reluctant to do as well. And then sometimes, even when they're doing both, they will have, you know, a lot of people will have good outcomes. But there's a substantial part of the population that doesn't get as much benefit as they want or need. And so, um, so that's been a big frustration for me over the last couple of decades. And when I was introduced to TMS a couple of years ago, that um, really was an eye-opening experience to see that there was something out there that um, that I really feel is going to be the next generation, the next evolution in mental health treatment, where we can really um, get to the deep areas of the brain to really change those neural uh, pathways and, and make a difference for people in a longer, longer term. Dr. Nanos, thank you so much. I really appreciate highlighting that there's this the connectivity right we might have some relational issues at home anxiety depression whatever it is it's manifesting in some sort of somatic or physical way and i'm hearing you say yeah my practice is about really figuring that out and not just putting a, a an immediate band-aid on things because we've seen that certainly in our practice we get we get people with these underlying issues but it's like but well, don't just do the superficial don't just Put the band-aid on the wound we need to get underneath there and figure out where's the infection if you wouldn't mind we've used the term tms multiple times i think uh you know we're kind of immersed in the language of that means if you wouldn't mind just for our you know our our new listeners to even define what tms is yeah. just give us an overview and an orientation and maybe what threw you over the edge to actually explore this would be really great yeah, absolutely. So TMS trans stands for transcranial magnetic stimulation. And the second I say those words, my next words are usually it is not electric shock therapy. And <laughs> there's no electrical current going into the brain. Because right. the second you say that, that's what people tend to think. Um, so TMS uses magnetic field energy, energy to deliver um, pulses into deep areas of the brain called the salience network, where our depression and anxiety centers tend to lie. And so, um, and it also it treats other, other disorders as well, but um, the primary focus is, is tends to be on, on depression and anxiety. So what a lot of people don't realize is that TMS has been around for over 20, 30 years now. It's been FDA approved for depression and anxiety specifically since 2008. So it's been FDA approved for 15 years. And, um, the reason it hasn't really taken hold in the greater community is because the way the original protocol was approved was a kind of onerous process. And so initially it was, um, and still this is how it's delivered in, in most parts of the country and the world. It's, you need 40 sessions to get a therapeutic effect, at least 40 sessions. Each session takes about um, anywhere from four to 15 minutes, depending on, on what areas you're treating. And typically the original protocol calls for going in every day for 40 consecutive days to get treated. Now, outside of research, research institutions, that's hard for people to do on a regular basis and see it through to completion. Um, doing anything 40 days consecutively is is a tough uh, a tough thing to do. And so what we were finding is people were kind of falling off and not completing the the treatments and not getting the therapeutic effect that um, that they were expected to have. And so that's why it hasn't been that popular until a few years ago at Stanford, a bunch of researchers got together to uh, conduct a number of randomized controlled uh, clinical trials to see if perhaps condensing the protocol to a shorter time frame of four to five days 
was as effective as doing the 40 to 50 day protocol. And lo and behold, not only was it as effective, it was way more effective. And that became known as the accelerated Stanford or SAINT protocol, uh, which was FDA approved last year for, um, um, for administering TMS. And what that does is condenses the treatment to um, doing those five to 15 minute sessions eight to 10 times a day instead of daily. So this way you're completing the treatment in four or five days. So you're being treated over 40 hours in a week. So I'm going to interrupt you because this is, this is monumental. I mean, this is huge to go from five week protocol to saying, and I, I just want to highlight this. So everybody knows the random control trials is the highest form of research that we can get validated, all of that stuff. Just, it really is. And so there's so much validation and reliability behind these studies to be able to show that hey, we're moving away from actually actually more effectiveness, the equal or even more effectiveness than to doing the standard protocol, which is phenomenal. I, just on a personal note, I got to ask you, I would imagine even saying that probably ruffles some feathers in the TMS world. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think... Not in a bad way. I'm just saying, I, I wonder. I think it's just a matter. So it, it is It is a relatively newer approach to doing something that we already know works very well. But like you said, it's been it's been scientifically validated. There's a lot of evidence behind it. It's FDA approved already in the accelerated form. But um, it, it is, frankly, hard to do and um, hard, hard to administer in practice. So what we're finding is a lot of the um, the TMS clinics um, around the country are are still doing the extended protocol and and doing some of the accelerated protocols as well. Um, I my understanding is we're we're one of the few clinics that only does the accelerated protocol, so that's the only kind of TMS protocol we offer, and we do it over the course of four to five days here in our our practice in Encinitas, um, and the 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 other unique aspect to the way we deliver TMS is that we also incorporate health coaching and um, and a lot of support around the treatments. So typically in, a, in your standard TMS clinics, you'll get treated, come, you know, do whatever you need to do for an hour, come back. What we do in that time in between TMS is our health coaches are working with patients to give them tools that they can use beyond their TMS experience to help them better um, get the most out of their, their TMS treatment. So for example, that may be, you know, cognitive reframing, positive, um, you know, um, positive affirmations, uh, meditation, mindfulness, breath work, journaling, any number of activities. And then we've also partnered with therapists who will occasionally have, will have a whole TMS corp, uh, cohort that's um, the patients of a particular therapist and that therapist will come in and also work with those patients where we've seen even more um, impressive results. And so what I, what I tell people is TMS is not the be all and end all. It doesn't exist in a vacuum. It really is one very powerful tool in a bigger mental health toolkit. And what we want to do is give you as many of those tools for coping as we can so that when you come out of it, you are able to sustain that what TMS essentially does is give you better emotional control and um, better ability to regulate uh, your thoughts and behavior patterns. Um, and that's what we want to do in the long term. And so we also incorporate long term follow up with our TMS protocol. So our health coaches are working with patients once a week uh, for six weeks after their treatment and then for an entire year monthly after that to ensure that they're getting where they need to be. Such tremendous follow-up, and I really want to make sure that um, this is articulated. You did such a great job to say, we're coupling that. We're doing the TMS along with bolstering. If we're seeing more regulatory ability with the brain, it's, wow, we're doing psychotherapy. We're doing mindfulness. We're doing all of these other things. And I always call it, it gets the, the flywheel of health going, right? I mean, if you're more regulated and your exactly. your relationships are going to be better and then there's more nurturing and love. And then, I mean, it really tends to get this, uh, the flywheel or the, or the snowball going. And I, I'm sure you've, 
have a lot of, I'm sure, amazing stories um, to say, gosh, this is actually, it's working and that's why we're doing it. Oh yeah, it has made all the difference. Incorporating that health coaching component, um, we already see, we've had a couple of unintended natural experiments where we didn't have the health coaching. For example, there were a couple few months ago where one of our health coaches was really sick and couldn't come in. And so we didn't, we didn't have that. Um, and those patients did great, but not as well as, as, um, as, as the ones that were getting the, the regular health coaching on a, on a consistent basis. So um, it's, it's been incredible to see. I mean, we, and we treated, we treated so many different kinds of people with different experiences and different um and different issues that they're grappling with we've you know treated moms with severe postpartum depression who've been suicidal we've treated teen, you know teenagers adolescents um with severe anxiety disorders um we've also had the privilege to take people out of acute suicidality you know i've had patients come to me telling me they're gonna you know on a monday when we're starting treatment telling me that if this doesn't work, they'll be killing themselves on Friday, which is horrifying. Um, and we've been able to take them out of that in that condition and keep them in remission. Um, it takes a lot of work and there's a lot of, so, you know, there are a lot of elements that go into that. I don't want to mislead people to thinking it's just the TMS. There's, there's a whole network of support that we've built around that. Um, and like I said, the TMS is one very, very powerful tool to help us get patients there. Um, but it is definitely, it definitely takes a, a village. And it's what's so amazing talking about the, you know, major depressive disorder, the high suicidality. Um, we've certainly seen that a lot. And I, I just want to ask, it's what's so fascinating to me is the TMS is it's non-invasive. Uh, like we're not hooking you up to IV. We're not injecting you with anything. Cause you right. know, especially in, in this world with, we're seeing this rates of su adolescent suicidality that you know, it's we see a lot of recommendation from psychiatrists. Well, you might want to consider ketamine as a way to get on this. And I just want maybe maybe give us your perspective on, you know, where does TMS fit with that? Absolutely, and and there's definitely um, a lot of interest now in in, in ketamine, and also coming coming down the road psychedelics as well, um, which is fast becoming um, you know more readily accepted in, in the in the wider community. But, um, and there's definitely a role for those and, and for those treatments as well and those modalities. So I don't want people to think I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm not against any particular modality. I think it's a very individualized decision that, you know, people have to explore with their, with their own providers. But um, the, the amazing thing about TMS for me is that it has no long-term side effect, which is not something I can say about anything else I do in medicine, literally nothing. So... <laughs> So for, for me, that's that's huge. And to be able to give people an extremely safe way to deal with really complex problems is 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 life changing. We've changed so many people's lives and um, done it in a really safe and effective way. Um, so what I I didn't get a chance to really explain how TMS actually works. So what what is happening is when we're when we're doing those um, those deep magnetic pulses into the brain we are looking at these areas in the brain where our depression and anxiety centers live. And what happens is we tend to, um, everybody has this, we have these negative loops in our brain where when we're stressed or have a, you know, a, a triggering event or something that is uncomfortable for us, we can often go to these negative loops that are very well-worn pathways um, of, of uh, negativity. And so, the, the pathology comes when you can't get out of those negative pathways and, and find your way out of that to a more positive space. And so what the TMS is actually doing is, is physically creating new um, synaptical connections and creating new neuronal pathways in the brain to allow for these positive networks to form. So that instead, what it, you can think of it as expanding your brain to create more space for these positive networks so that when you are encountering something that's upsetting or difficult or challenging in any way, instead of going right into that negative loop, you have a positive loop to go into instead. And so that's really how it works. Um, and it's, it's pretty remarkable. It's very remarkable. My gosh. And so if I can ask you some questions, I mean, 
it, so the the pulsing literally is it disrupting the existing neural synaptic connection so it allows or how is that how is that frequency changing or allowing for some new neuroplasticity yeah, sure. to take place would be helpful it, it's not disrupting existing connections it's actually creating new ones so for example, we know um, in cases with traumatic brain injury and post-concussive syndrome, a lot of those patients um, have damaged connections. And so what it does is it can strengthen um, and create, it can strengthen existing connections. So it's not breaking things up, it's strengthening and building up. So there isn't a disruption. It's more, you can think of it more of as a, 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 a like a muscle, a muscle workout. So um, I like to use the analogy sometimes like what you're doing, you can think of your brain as, a, as another muscle and you're strengthening that muscle and giving it the ability to have resilience and like we said, neuroplasticity and to be able to respond to these you know, events that happen through all of our lives that are, that are, that are challenging. It's so great. It's so great. If, if I were a new clinician, where, where can I go to learn more about this? I mean, it's like most of us just learning about this. Where would you recommend as a first step if you're a practitioner or a, a parent or, you know, you're struggling with your own issues? Um, that's a great question. There, is, be, there isn't a great, um, well, so I'd say the, um, the, clini the International Clinical TMS Society is one of the main bodies that kind of aggregates a lot of the, the TMS research. Um, that would be a good starting point. We have on our website a lot of the um, the 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 relevant journal articles. Um, you know, we have a, a a long PDF that kind of condenses all of it um, with all the the relevant studies. Um, and there's not, you know, there's not like a, really my mission is education because there's not a lot of it out there right now. So I wish I could give <laughs> give you. Well, I'm going to make a plug for your website because you sent that to me and it was incredibly helpful. Um, if you just wouldn't mind, tell us what the website is and for listeners to access, that would be great. Sure. It's um, www.kindhealthgroup.com. And if you scroll to the TMS section, there's a lot of links there. We have a really great um, animated video that explains it in really simple terms that a lot of people find very helpful. Um, and then we have a number of patient testimonials, as well as a lot of the relevant research studies, um, and then links to those, which then link you to other studies as well. So you can go down a long rabbit hole of, of, uh, of great studies. That's incredible. Well, I, I got to ask just because I want to is that, have you tried it yourself? Of course. And? Yes, I was one of the first patients. So I, you know, I didn't feel like I could in good conscience recommend something that I hadn't, this dramatic that I hadn't tried myself. So I myself have some mild anxiety just by virtue of being a human and, and in this world and being a doctor and a mom. Um, so I, and I have some insomnia as well. So I tried it about a year ago. And for me, you know, my, I have thoughts going a million miles a minute at all times, can't like shut it down. Very typical type A person. And um, Rumination, we call it, right? yeah. yes, exactly. For me, it helped really give me a sense of calm and focus and help me center myself in a way that I had frankly never experienced before. I was sleeping much better than I ever had. Oh, and this is the other thing that I forgot to mention. The other thing we started introducing for our patients um, in the last couple of months was, is an aura ring. So we give all of our TMS patients an aura ring. And if you're not familiar with an aura ring, it's a little tiny wearable device here that is worn as a ring and it has a bunch of sensors in it. And what that does, it's probably the best wearable sleep tracker on the market right now. Um, and Apple watches are great too. We can get data from Apple watches, but most people tend to take their watch off at night. But the ring is the best way to track sleep um, and variations in sleep, which correlate um, very closely with a lot of mental health issues as well. So we're looking at sleep, heart rate variability, um, oxygen saturation, steps, activity, all that stuff. So, so we're measuring um, all of that data as well and, and conducting a study based on that. And so we're, we're gathering lots of information. 
I somehow derailed myself. I don't remember what the question was. Well, I, I think it was great because for all of those, you know, research type data people, you know, scientific method, you're correlating all of this data, which is actually pretty unique. I know other TMS does a depression inventory on a regular basis, but it's, I haven't seen the robustness of saying, hey, no, let's correlate all of, all of this different, really quantitative data. Right. And, and that's what a lot of people want. Um, so we obviously do, uh, you know, the, all the standard questionnaires, GAD7, PCL5, PH29, all that, you know, repeatedly over and over and over. But having this, um, like you said, this quantitative data is definitely new um, in this in this area. So we're right, really excited to see what that is going to start looking like. And so generally, when people sign up for TMS, I have them, um, we size them for the aura ring. We have them start wearing it at least a couple of weeks before they're treated. And then obviously during the treatment week, and then they continue to wear it for, you know, forever. <laughs> well, so, what what an cool. absolute tremendous practice. I it, So it, just in, in kind of closing, I, I want to ask you, like, you're developing this practice, you're venturing out to TMS. I mean, what does the future hold for uh, Dr. Nanos? Oh, I want to bring this to as many people as possible. Um, I just think everybody can benefit from it. Um, even if, you know, we we all have had some trauma in our lives and we've all been through a collective trauma of COVID at a baseline. Um, so there's that. My goal is to make this, to educate people as much as possible about it, whether they get it with me or with anyone else. I don't care. I want people to know about it and have the ability to um, to get treated and find you know a way to live their best possible lives, and that's the most important thing to me, for us all to find joy in our lives and purpose. and And I think the other piece of it too is, for what I've seen in the way we practice, is um, building that human connection with people, and that's really important to me too. And we're building these very deep relationships, and that's always how I've wanted to practice medicine. And um, I think in a world where there's a lot of movement away from human connection, we're trying to bring it back because that's where um, that's where I think we can all find more meaning. I'm smiling, Dr. Nanos, because th those of us who, who listen to the podcast all know I, just interpersonal neurobiology and understanding the science of relationship is just really it's it's where we're at and trying to move forward, and we're we're seeing that more and more and. Rates of empathy are lower than ever in our society. People are lonelier than ever, and yet clustered closer together. So I just love that you're, you you have such an amazing practice, really weaving it all in. And thank you for being on today. We you've certainly educated all of us and educated me. I can't tell you how how grateful I am that you've been a part of the podcast. Thank you. And please get get on um Dr. Web uh, Dr. Nanos's website and look that up if you want to learn more about TMS and her practice and. You can access this podcast where, however you access podcasts through Apple or, or whatever. But Dr. Nanos, thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Rob. It's been a pleasure.